just build for a second on the on the medical thing, on the, because it is something I've dwelt on and also just done done work on. I uh, was very lucky. I've got a friend called uh, Ara Darzi, who's in the House of Lords, and he's the professor of, um, of medicine at Imperial College. He's a really fine man, and uh, I spent a day with him recently at Imperial, looking. Uh, he's the man that literally invented keyhole keyhole surgery. And he invented keyhole surgery, and there's kind of a, a metaphor here in a way because he realized the amount of damage that was done by the invasion. That's to say the cut. The cut in a, in a, in a surgical in, 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 in an operation was doing as much, if not more, damage than, the, than what you did the other, when you got the other side of the cut. That's where keyhole surgery came from. Um, and he showed me all the things they're doing in um, at Imperial, and it is mind-blowing. And, and my point really is, it is exactly like being on a spaceship. A, a modern, a, a really modern, so the uh, social environment is like being on a, a, you know, a, on a, on a spaceship. And the point I was trying to make in, in the laws of elsewhere was if you took a brilliant surgeon, and I mean a brilliant surgeon, in 1912, and you put him into that environment, there is nothing he could do. Nothing. It would have completely gone outside of his realm of not just competencies, but even his imagination. And it is absolutely the case that if you took a brilliant teacher from 1912, in most subjects, she would still deliver, it probably would be all of them, she would still deliver to a primary or secondary in the class uh, a very competent lesson. And yet there's another feature here, uh, just, I'm sorry, just, just trotting out statistics. My understanding is that we have learned since 1985, we've learned 75% more than we previously knew about the way the brain works since the creation of the scan. So we've got this extraordinary revolution in our understanding of the way the brain works, We've got this extraordinary revolution in the way that the body can be healed, repaired, whatever, and yet some, somehow none of that has penetrated the process of teaching and learning. And the real issues we'll be touching on at lunch, at the lunch time is why? Where, what are the fear factors? What is holding people back? Is it that teachers themselves don't have the sense of adventure that a surgeon has? Uh, are not, you know, because they don't, maybe don't come from engineering backgrounds? What is it that we need to do to uh, just up the game? And there's another really, really interesting feature. I started talking about this stuff in, we were talking earlier, with a friend of mine, Stephen Heffel, in 1990. I checked back. First time I actually was on the stage was on, on this, this type of thinking with 1990. Um, it is, at, first of all, amazing to my colleagues and I that we've developed so, so little in the 22 years since we really started going up and stomp on this. Um, but during that 22 years, an entire generation of teachers have become technologically literate. So we're not dealing with uh, the kind of fear factor that might have explained it in 1990. 2010, uh, probably a third of all teachers have got, maybe not half, have got really quite sophisticated with, with, uh, with technology. And again, why isn't that making the move? I have a, a theory that I've tried out in the groups here, and this is where I've come out at is there is actually, I think, a magic triangle. If you accept the possibility, that there is a real possibility of very, very good, very well-trained, very confident teachers. What that teacher, I believe, needs is a skilled, a skilled teacher with an interactive whiteboard, I'll explain why, but I really do believe in interactive whiteboards, the iPad and the assessment process that links the two. That's to say that what the young person is doing on the iPad is being fed back onto the iPad, uh, onto the whiteboard, and you've got a continuous assessment process the whiteboard itself, as they become more and more sophisticated, is a, is a remarkable tool. You can stream video through it. You can use any form of stimulus that you think is appropriate to the lesson you're teaching or the subject you're trying to grapple with. And you've got this process. And I was trying to say briefly at, at, at lunch why I think it's interesting. Is that I looked at the Victorian school and what I discovered was that very early on, 1812 actually, there was, there was blackboards, sort of a, a former blackboard, and a teacher, and the teacher stood in the front, and there was obviously mixed ability, mixed, mixed age classes, and it was not very effective. And the big breakthrough in the Victorian uh, schoolroom came with the introduction of the individual slate for the child. That was the breakthrough, because all of us, and when you think about it, it's absolutely logical, because all of a sudden, the teacher put A, B, and C, or one, two, and three up on the blackboard, the child copied one, two, three, the teacher could see what the child was doing, the child could take the slate home and practice, and, the, and suddenly we had a process that wasn't just didactic, it was fluid. And oddly, 
that's weird. We've got another form of technology that, in a sense, replicates that, but we're not actively using it. Um, the other thing we talked about was cost. My overwhelming belief is if you want to be a 21st century nation, and Ireland does want to be a 21st century nation, I desperately want Ireland to be a 21st century nation, the cost thing has to be just dealt with. And the analogy, again, we were spinning at the lunch was that the, the invention just before the First World War of the machine gun. There was no point once the machine gun had been invented in saying, very, very nice piece of equipment, but we can't afford them. Because uh, that was not a good idea. You might have afforded machine guns or you lost the war. And I think we're at that point. We either afford, we either afford to invest in their futures or we've lost the war. And it's a real war. It's a real, I was in China uh, last weekend. You know, the Chinese are very ambitious and very smart. There are other nations. The Koreans are very ambitious, very smart. They're not going to sit around waiting for us to get our act together. You know, this is tough. If we're going to, there's a nation, going to find a, a healthy place for ourselves and our young people in the latter part of the 21st century, we owe it to them. Literally, we owe it to them to give them a shot. And the shot they'll get is by being as competent, as confident as any other young people anywhere in the world. And at the moment, we are really in danger of using lack of resources to allow ourselves to get behind the eight ball. Um, I'll be saying tonight in the, in the lecture, in the end, a vast nation like Ireland, education is the whole ball of wax. It is not just one among a number of, of social priorities. It's the ball of wax. Why? Because only a fine education system over time will create the resources that will create a health service, that will create pensions, will create all the other components of a civil society that we need. We won't do it the other way. You have the greatest health service in the world. If you haven't got a good education system, it will collapse. You have the greatest pensions in the world. They're unaffordable. Only an education system generates a future for a country. And, the, and I almost feel silly saying it. It's so utterly self-evident. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of daft conversation to be having, because we know it. And yet somehow, politically, it's an inconvenient uh, conversation to have.